please welcome Michael Turner. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and talk about dark matter. Um, and I'm assigned to talk about dark matter in particle physics. Um, and first of all, just a step back uh, to touch where Jim touched. Um, so we have this amazing cosmological model today uh, that has been uh, powered by big ideas, the connections between quarks and the cosmos, and that's what I'll largely be talking about, and also powerful instruments. And Jim touched upon uh, the remarkable increase in the amount of uh, uh, data. And particle dark matter, the idea that the dark matter is made of uh, a new form of matter, particles left over from the early universe, is one of the pillars of modern cosmology. And Jim touched upon these three pillars, that this model that we have that, uh, for lack of a better name, is sometimes called Lambda CDM, has ha its pillars are dark matter, dark energy, and inflation. And the remarkable thing about these three pillars, um, which leads to this connection between quarks and the cosmos and why particle physicists are interested in cosmology, is that if you look at the standard model of particle physics, and uh, here it is, here are the uh, constituents of matter, the quarks and leptons, and here are the uh, force carriers, the bosons, and uh, you know, here's what an atom looks like in terms of its uh, 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 made up of, of these fundamental particles. Um, None of this, none of these particles can explain the dark matter, the dark energy, or why we have inflation. And so if this theory is correct, uh, then we're going to learn a lot about fundamental physics. And so I will zero in on, uh, on the dark matter, the idea that the dark matter uh, is a new form of, uh, of uh, matter. And I thought it's very important uh, because this is the most conservative hypothesis today for the dark matter. So Jim was talking about the history of dark matter. We have worked ourselves into a corner where the dark matter, the, the simplest, the most conservative hypothesis is it's a new form of matter. And that's a fairly bold hypothesis. That's where we are. It may not be right just because, well, in the United States, we understand that most conservative doesn't always mean most right. And uh, so what is the evidence? And uh, the evidence, the airtight evidence for it is a 40 sigma discrepancy. So, uh, uh, and that discrepancy is between the amount of atomic matter or baryonic matter and the total amount of matter. And so if you ignore the Hubble constant, uh, here's a bit of our history about our inability to measure the Hubble constant. Little h uh, parameterizes the Hubble constant in units of 100. We now know little h is about 0.7, but so you can just ignore that. Uh, the amount of uh, baryonic matter um, is about 4.5%, uh, because little h squared is a half. And the, um, the total amount of, of uh, matter is closer to 30%. And when you look at the error bars, these two numbers differ by 40 sigma. So that says that the uh, matter cannot be baryons. There's much more matter uh, than there are atoms or baryonic matter to explain it. And that evidence comes uh, from two things that Jim touched upon. One is uh, measurements of the cosmic microwave background, and the other is uh, measurements of the amount of deuterium produced in the Big Bang. And so here is a plot of the uh, light elements produced in the Big Bang. This is the baryon to photon ratio, or here is uh, omega baryon. And uh, the deuterium varies very rapidly with the baryon density. And so when you determine uh, the baryon, sorry, when you determine the deuterium abundance, you've determined the amount of matter in the universe, and you get this small number compared to the total amount of matter. So that's the strongest piece of evidence. Um, this is just to remind you, uh, since a lot of this comes from the cosmic microwave background, uh, we look out into space, we look back in time, and the microwave background takes us back to a time when the universe was about 400,000 years old, when it was going from uh, ionized gas to neutral gas. It's the surface of last scattering for light in the universe. Um, 
we have these wonderful images of uh, the universe when it was 380,000 years old, when it was simple enough for physicists to study it. Astronomers can study, study complicated systems. Physicists are much more simple-minded. And so this is a time uh, when, when the universe, uh, no stars, no galaxies, uh, as Jim said, almost uniform. Uh, this false color picture of the universe, the variations in the temperature or the density are at the level of 0.001%. And of course now we have a better picture uh, from the Planck satellite. And Jim, I think, showed uh, this decomposition, mathematical decomposition of these temperature differences uh, decomposed into multiples. Uh, and here is the theory. The theory is the line. And there are the data points. And the theory fits very, very well. So I show this. Uh, how do we determine the matter density? So the matter density uh, is determined by the height of this first peak. So uh, this first peak is controlled by the matter density, the baryon density, by the ratio of the height of the first to the second peak. So that's what revealed to us what the universe is made out of. The position of the first peak in multiple space tells us the shape of the universe and the fact that it is at L equals 200 tells us we have a flat universe. So that's the evidence I said that. Uh, of course, there's additional evidence um, uh, that uh, we have non-baryonic dark matter. And Jim talked about that. We now understand the large-scale structure of the universe very well. And if the universe only had baryons in it, we could not make that structure. We need dark matter to make that structure. That's a very strong piece of evidence. The, the, um, since I'm representing particle physics here, I can give a little poke at particle physicists. Their favorite evidence often that we have non-baryonic dark matter is the bullet cluster. And the bullet cluster is not evidence for non-baryonic dark matter. Uh, but it's a really, really pretty picture. So uh, there we go. So what about the candidates? So this, Jim was alluding to this earlier. That um, So the particle physicists uh, have this wonderful standard model of particle physics. And there are things about the uh, universe that it does not explain, in addition to dark matter, dark energy, and inflation. For example, uh, why there are so many elementary particles, why there are different forces, uh, why there are different scales in physics. And so uh, since the establishment of the standard model um, in the 70s or 80s, particle physicists have not been sitting on their laurels, but they've been thinking about what, what is the grander theory. And uh, so the grander theory often predicts the existence of additional particles of nature. And some of these particles of nature turn out to be compelling dark matter candidates. And they're compelling not from the fact that they can explain dark matter, because as Jim said, um, a lot of things could be the dark matter. Uh, but compelling from the point of view that they're predicted by a theory that solves problems in particle physics. Of course, these new particles, if they're to play the role of dark matter, have to either be stable or very long-lived. Um, because we know a lot about the universe, there must be a mechanism to ensure that there's the right amount of them left over from the Big Bang to explain uh, uh, the dark matter that we see in the universe. We know enough about the universe that you can't just say, well, the dark matter is schmucksels. Uh, you can say that, but now you have to explain where did the schmucksels come from and why did you get the right number of schmucksels. And so we know that the universe started out uh, uh, a soup of elementary particles. So you have to have a mechanism for making sure that they have the right abundance. And then this last one is not a requirement, but um, it, it's a feature that we would love to have because at the end of the day, and this will be largely this afternoon, we would like to be able to test this very bold hypothesis. We don't just want a cool idea. Uh, as Jim Peebles said, the goal of, of physics is not to construct beautiful theories. The goal of physics is to figure out how the universe really works. So at the end of the day, that's, that's the criterion. So talking about um, where these particles, classifying these particles, so some of them, um, as uh, Gianfranco said, um, 
were once in thermal equilibrium in the early universe, and we call them thermal relics. So they were once in thermal equilibrium, and um, as the universe cooled down, uh, thermal equilibrium tells us that they would disappear, that their abundance, so here's time and here's their abundance, that their abundance would decrease with time and eventually uh, go to zero. Eventually their annihilations would reduce them to nothing. However, if these particles uh, interact weakly, eventually they decouple and start, stop disappearing. And so this leads to a classification of uh, hot relics, particles that decoupled and uh, stopped disappearing uh, very early on when they had an abundance comparable to uh, photons. And the one example we know for sure of that are neutrinos. And of course, neutrinos are particles that are actually known to exist. Then there are particles that we call cold, and they decouple uh, much later. They annihilate for a while, so they stay in equilibrium longer and then eventually decouple and their abundance is much less than photons. So uh, th their abundance is determined by their incomplete annihilations. And uh, we often refer to, refer to this group as WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. And then I want to point out something that I don't really like the term, but since it's used so much, I, I, I will just mention it. The so-called WIMP miracle, that um, if you calculate how do you get omega equals one, what cross-section do you need? What, what is the strength of their annihilations to get omega equals one? Uh, the cross-section is a weak interaction cross-section. And so that's either a really, really big hint that uh, the creator is giving us, or it's, it's a grand misdirection. And in any case, it's called the Wimp Miracle. And then I will, I will I'll leave for questions. Of course, if you have hot and cold, there's an intermediate case called warm, but uh, not so much focus on that. Uh, oh, here's the origin of the word Wimp, I believe. I think this is the first paper that used the word Wimp. Uh, in 1985, there it is, weakly interacting massive particles. And there is a little story to be told about this. Just because you invent the term doesn't mean you get to define it. And uh, uh, I like the idea that it would refer to any dark matter particle, but uh, it now just refers to, to, the, to these ones that, have, uh, that satisfy the WIMP miracle. Um, then there are the non-thermal relics. Uh, particles that weren't in thermal equilibrium, and I'll just mention two of them here. So the axion is, is quite an interesting particle. So this is a particle uh, whose existence uh, was uh, involves solving a problem of the standard model. The standard model, this glorious model that the particle physicists have, uh, explains almost everything in nature and only has one bad prediction. And it's one bad prediction is that the neutron should have an electric dipole moment that is slightly larger than that observed. And slightly larger means about 13 orders of magnitude. And uh, so there's one solution, and that's to introduce a new symmetry, and that's a broken symmetry, and it leads to a new particle called the axion. And uh, the axion uh, is very light. It's stable. How light is it? Its math is, is a millionth of a millionth of that of the electron. And um, it's produced in a very unusual way. It's produced as a Bose condensate, as coherent uh, scalar field oscillations. And again, you can calculate how that goes, and there would be the right amount of axions to be the dark matter. Or, and I, I won't touch upon this, maybe someone will ask a question about this, maybe if the dark matter particle and its antiparticle are not the same particle, maybe there's more dark matter particles, just like there are more quarks than antiquarks. And the reason that there are atoms today is that slight excess of quarks in the early universe. Maybe it's the same with the dark matter, and maybe those two are related. I'll come back to that at the very end. And so this is a diagram of the leading dark matter particles uh, today. So the thinking man's particle, the axion, um, the, uh, the WIMP, or uh, the best example of the WIMP I'll come to in a minute is the lightest supersymmetric particle. And then the neutrinos, why not use neutrinos? They're actually known to exist, and we know how many of them there are per cubic centimeter to three significant figures. It's just the mass. And when I made this slide in 1990, we didn't know the masses. 
Unfortunately, we, now, we don't know the masses precisely, but we have an upper limit on the masses that tell us that neutrinos contribute about as much to the universe as stars do. So they're not enough to be the dark matter. So let me talk a little bit about um, the development of this radical idea that uh, the dark matter um, is a new form of matter. And so I'm going to walk you through a timeline um, and some of this has been touched upon by Jim. Um, so this starts purely in the court of astrophysics um, with Zwicky and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Vera Rubin and, and others and we'll hear more about particularly about extending the rotation curves to, to large distances. And I was surprised that Jim didn't mention there was a very interesting paper written, I forget what year it was, 1975, um, about the idea that uh, galaxies should have giant halos uh, in order to stabilize the, the, uh, the disk uh, structure. So anyway, um, this was the discovery period of dark matter. Uh, the ball was totally in the court of the astronomers. Um, the particle physicists started to play in this game in the 1970s um, and the idea was that uh, we could use the cosmic mass density. Uh, we know there's only so much mass in the universe um, to limit particle masses. And uh, the idea is the following. If we know how many particles would be left over from the Big Bang, um, we know an upper limit to the mass density. And uh, in, uh, that would allow an upper limit to the, uh, the mass of the particle in question. And so, for example, on the neutrino side, there were papers written by Alex Zale and George Marx limiting uh, the neutrino rest mass and by Kausik and McCle Mc McClellan uh, also limiting the neutrino rest mass. I think this is 1972 and 1974. And then there was uh, an interesting paper written by uh, Ben Lee, a certified particle physicist, and Steven Weinberg, another certified particle physicist, um, looking at an extension of the standard model. In fact, the standard model wasn't established yet. And uh, so they uh, looked at a, a theory that had a heavy neutrino that was stable, and they calculated how many of them would be left over from the Big Bang and limited the masses of those particles and also quipped, uh, also sort of discovered the WIMP miracle here because they quipped if the, if the mass was a couple of GeV, um, you would have the right, you, you would uh, uh, saturate the mass limit and the, the universe would be dominated by these hypothetical particles. Um, I am a big believer in the fact that um, uh, of Pauli's quote. Uh, Pauli once said, sir, your paper wasn't even wrong. And uh, that means it was trivially right. That uh, some of the most influential papers ever written are wrong papers. And so uh, in 1980, I think this pay, uh, there it is, 1980, uh, there was a Russian experiment that detected a mass for the electron neutrino. And it detected a mass in the range of about 30 eV. And here's the formula for omega neutrino. And if you put in 30 eV, you get omega of about 1. So this got everyone excited. It turned out this is a very, very hard experiment to do. The experimenters were very good, but it was a hard experiment to do. And it got people really interested in the idea that we might live in a neutrino-dominated universe. Here is a paper that was written by uh, my mentor, uh, David Schramm and Gary Steigman, uh, which I think was the first paper that talked about a neutrino-dominated universe and all of its wonders. So 1980, uh, that we might have a universe dominated by a new form of matter. And the mid-1980s, we've now worked ourselves up to the mid-1980s, uh, the birth of, uh, of inflation and cold dark matters, and I call the 1980s the period where the, where the particle physicists started to really own the idea of dark matter. Uh, in fact, own it more than the astronomers. And um, so, of course, the idea of inflation is that we live in a flat universe and that the seeds for galaxies uh, uh, came from the, the seed density perturbations from galaxy, for galaxies came from quantum fluctuations. 
Those are the two basic ideas. Of course, the flat universe means omega equals one, and we know baryons can't contribute omega equals one, so that means they're going to have to be something else. And these two ideas are the two ingredients that are needed to uh, specify how structure was formed. So uh, here are the various papers on inflation, Alan Guth, uh, Andre Linde, an example of, uh, in fact, Linde's paper is an example of a brilliant paper, the transformational kind of paper that changes the course of science with not a correct equation in it. And, uh, and I say that not, Andre, I deeply respect Andre, but it's, science is a one, this is a whole nother lecture about the importance of, uh, uh, and then the paper by uh, Steinhardt, and so on. So this is inflation and then the idea that uh, inflation produces uh, fluctuations, density fluctuations, the so-called scale invariant density fluctuations that Jim talked about uh, uh, that are, are seed all the structure in the universe. So there were four different papers uh, written on that. And then um, once you put that together with cold dark matter, um, you have uh, the uh, cold dark matter scenario of structure formation. So uh, I wrote a paper with Frank Wilczek and Tony Z, and there is the paper that Jim Peebles wrote talking about uh, cold dark matter. And um, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, although things were not as well determined at that time as they are now, uh, based upon the light element abundances already in, let's see, what date is this, 1984, uh, there was a limit to the baryon density uh, very close to what we've now measured, uh, saying, and if you put in our uncertainty about the Hubble constant, uh, omega baryon couldn't be greater than about 0.19. And so if you really wanted a universe, uh, if you wanted this flat universe of inflation, you needed... Uh, non-baryonic dark matter. And this is where supersymmetric dark matter came into play. So, paper written by Heinz Pagels and Joel Premack uh, talking about the lightest superpartner is generally stable, or at least long-lived. It's usually the neutralino and has a mass of 10 to 1,000 times that of the proton and is a WIMP. And uh, another paper by uh, John Ellis and his collaborators talking about supersymmetric relics from the Big Bang. Um, here is a very influential conference that we, we, it's known as the Woodstock of Quarks and the Cosmos at Fermilab in 1984. And that, I think that actually was me. And uh, what was interesting about that is that the conference is where hot dark matter officially died, and Simon White will probably mention that. So this top-down scenario just didn't work. And uh, roughly at the same time, the first serious simulations of cold dark matter were done, and they looked pretty good. Although I wish I had this slide. Even then, it was realized that the combination of uh, omega and the Hubble constant should be closer to a third. And if you do the numbers, that means unless H is one, sorry, uh, unless H is a third, you can't have omega equals one. So this was already alluding to the fact that you're not going to have enough matter in the universe. And then there was a very influential review article written by Blumenthal, Faber, Premack, and Martin Rees uh, laying out this theory called cold dark matter that is a great theory. Why is it a great theory? It's so bold and expansive that the observers want to go out and disprove it. And... Uh, Let's see, Jim talked about formation from the bottom up. There was a very influential IAU symposium where astronomers got interested in particle dark matter uh, in 1985, held in, um, oh darn, what's that city in New Jersey? Um, there's a little college there. Princeton, Princeton, that's the one. Um, and the astron it was a very nice meeting, and the astronomers wanted to learn about the, the possibilities for dark matter. And... Um, in, 19, in the 1990s, we had the rise of uh, Lambda CDM because there was a problem even as early as 1984. Um, you know, we didn't know how big Omega was, and Omega was rising from this value in 1974 uh, where astronomers had measured something like a tenth, but it was, it was becoming clear that Omega matter might not be one, and so is there another way to do it? Uh, 
and Jim mentioned his paper on Lambda, and here's another paper on Lambda. And a very influential paper was the one that Jim mentioned, was uh, using, um, uh, using clusters as a fair sample of the universe to estimate omega matter. And the argument is, cluster is as big as a kitchen sink. Anyone disagree with that? It's really big. And so you look at the ratio of uh, total mass in clusters to atoms, and you assume that's the universal ratio, and you now multiply that by omega baryon, which is something we know well, and so you can estimate omega matter, and you get a third. And that really started changing the way people think. Uh, at about the same time, Burroughs and Teitler actually measured the deuterium abundance and so nailed down omega baryon. And so uh, it looks like omega matter is really a third. And so lambda CDM is born around then. Here, uh, Jim mentioned this, uh, an article in Science Magazine. In 1996, if you tried to ask uh, what versions of cold dark matter are viable, um, here's the version of cold dark matter with a Hubble constant of 30. Uh, if you really want a Hubble constant bigger than 50, the only viable model was lambda CDM. And of course, that's where we are today. And Jim mentioned that uh, this current paradigm of lambda CDM really got in place in about uh, right around 2000 with the discovery, discovery of dark energy through the discovery that the universe is accelerating. And the beautiful work of the boomerang experiment led by uh, the late Andrew Lang that showed that we live in a flat universe. So let me just finish up with a couple of slides here. Number one, closing the circle. So what the heck does closing the circle mean? So um, in cosmology, we're, we're doing archeology. span uh, we're, we're, but we'd like to say this is how, we really ha how it really happened. This is what Jim alluded to. So how do we get to the level of evidence where we can say this has really happened? Um, and I give three examples here. Helium, I'll come back to helium. Big Bang nucleosynthesis and the microwave background. Big Bang nucleosynthesis is a really, is, is a really good example. Most scientists believe that the universe was a nuclear reactor when it was uh, seconds old. I shouldn't use the word believe when I say science, but uh, why, do we, why do we think that's established? Well, we use nuclear physics as measured in the laboratory and we just transport it to the early universe, do a calculation of something that should be left over and verify that that is what's left over. So we close the circle. And the same with the microwave background. And I have a slide, let's see, uh, I have a slide on helium in a second. So how do we do that with dark matter? When will we be able to convince, I don't know if people know the, under, understand this joke here. So in Missouri, in the United States, that's called the show me state. They're, they're very hard to convince. You really have to show them good evidence. So when can we convince people that this bold hypothesis is correct? And we'll hear about that in the afternoon, the dark matter trifecta. Uh, Produce them at the LHC, so bottle them at the LHC. Uh, detect the particles that make up our own halo and detect their annihilations in the halo. Then I, th then I think we could close the circle on it. The, the first dark matter puzzle, the first discovery in fundamental physics uh, by astronomers was helium. So uh, these gentlemen noticed that there were some lines in, in the spectrum of the sun that had never been seen in the laboratory. And so they said there must be a new element. And that was in 1868. And in Ramsey, uh, Ramsey in 1895 actually found helium on Earth. And so we're trying to do the same thing with dark matter. And then let me end with, the, with this slide. And, um, almost in the same spirit as Jim, is that, you know, in the good old days when uh, Jim uh, was a cosmologist, the universe was really, really simple. We just had atoms. There wasn't even the microwave background. And now, look at the parts list for the universe. So we have baryons, we have neutrinos, we have cold dark matter, we have photons, we have, neut we have well, we have uh, light neutrinos, uh, we have dark energy. And I remind you of uh, Robbie's famous quote about the muon. Who ordered that? And to echo what Jim said earlier, is there any reason to believe that there aren't more entries in this list? And of course, now, uh, now there's a really interesting one. Why do, now there's a new puzzle. So why is the amount of cold dark matter and baryons the same 
to astrophysical accuracy. Well, actually, we now do precision cosmology, but... Uh, and uh, so uh, they're different. Maybe it's a coincidence between energy scales or, or maybe it's the asymmetric dark matter. And I just want to end with, with this slide. So uh, uh, the, the uh, great American philosopher H.L. Mencken uh, has a wonderful quote. Uh, For every complex problem, there is a solution that is simple, elegant, and wrong. And uh, so we are at a critical time with respect to Lambda CDM. It, it encapsulates our knowledge of the universe today, but it might be wrong. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here. So I think dark matter is a particle, although I see Eric Valinde back there who's got some really interesting ideas. Here's an idea that I don't think is right. Um, so maybe there's no dark matter, but I don't think it has to do with a theory called MOND. And so here's an offer that actually is probably going to be tweeted across the universe here. If MOND is right, I'll eat my PowerPoint. And that includes the laptop. Okay, so uh, I'll just end by saying, um, so this dark matter problem which started in, in, in astronomy is now part of the deep connections between quarks and the cosmos. The mysteries of astrophysics and cosmology are now the mysteries of particle physics. The best evidence for physics beyond the standard model comes from cosmology and the most well-developed example of that is dark matter and as we'll hear this afternoon maybe we're close to figuring out uh, the solution to dark matter maybe we're close to establishing the fact that it's that it's uh, a new form of matter thank you <laughs>